Our four Detroit sports teams have 22 world titles combined. Each of them meant something to this city and this state. The 1984 Tigers were more than champions to most. They helped define us. Fox Sports Detroit will air Game 5 of that World Championship Series at 8 o'clock tonight, and three of the champions are with us. Dan Petrie won 18 games during that special season. Kirk Gibson became the first Tiger in history to have 20 homers and 20 stolen bases in the same season. And Alan Trammell, the best shortstop in Tigers history, won the World Series MVP. Guys, thanks. Hope you and your families are safe and well. Tram, going into Game 5, what was the mood? What was the feeling going on in that clubhouse going into well, I mean, we were confident, and we had we had been confident all year, really, going starting after that 35-5. and five. But, um, you know, these guys can, uh, can can share their their input on this. But I know as much as I – I'm from San Diego. I think, as most people know, I did not want to come back to play another game, thinking back to what the Padres uh, had done to the Cubs when they were down 2 nothing and they won all three games. So for us, we wanted to celebrate at home as we did. We clinched the division. We clinched the pennant. And then ultimately in game five there, we did clinch it at home. And so you can celebrate anywhere, but obviously it's a little better to do it at home. So we wanted to win it that day. We wanted to win it on Sunday, the October 14th. And lo and behold, there's somebody uh, on their show today that uh, had a lot to do with it. But, uh, yeah, it was an ultimate feeling for all of us. Yeah, Dan, you started that clincher. What was the feeling like for you? Well, I, I mean, I think everybody plays out that scenario. Shep, you've you've talked about how important the 1984 team was in your life and everything. And, you know, you were, you know, everybody was, uh, you, when you were doing a, a batting stance or something, you were doing Alan Trammell or Tommy Brookins or something like that. And, you know, I played that scenario out like to pitch the clincher of a World Series when I was playing wiffle ball in the backyard and everything. So, you know, and, and after losing game two also, you know, it was, it was like, gosh, I don't want to, you know, go back to San Diego either. So, you know, I, I had it upon myself, at least, you know, with a with a gut feeling like, hey, I, I got to end it. I even told Gibby, he said, how you feeling? I said, Gibby, it's over, you know, at least mentally and everything going into it. That's the way I felt. It didn't quite turn out that way for me. But again, the teammates, uh, you know, again, you know, did the job, especially Gibby having just a tremendous game that day. Yeah, Gibby was phenomenal, man. I mean, that, that first inning homer, right? Everyone talks about the monument homer off Goose Gossage and for good reason. But Gibby, you were unbelievable in that game five. And you kind of set the tone early. The first pitch you see from Mark Thurman, you had nine homers off lefties all season long. You hit the first pitch you saw into the upper deck. And I thought it was really cool. When you went out to play right field, that whole area was giving you a standing ovation. What were uh, what were your thoughts on, on that one inning, not only the offensive part, but then going into the second defensively? Yeah, well, just before we get to that, that play, you know, we – clinched the division, the pennant, and we wanted to win the World Series, like Tram said. And I think back when I was a little kid watching the Tigers, one of their very unique batting stances was Dick McCullough, right? Yeah. Left-handed mm -hmm. hitter. Yeah. So Tram, I mean, no, many young kids at that time, Tram was kind of the Dick McCullough of, of our era. And, you know, you have these dreams. We all did, Danny, Tram, and I about getting to the World Series, and we were well prepared by Sparky Anderson. He had a, he never let us um, relax. And, and I remember almost holding my breath every pitch that we played in that World Series. Mm. Even when it was 8-4, it was like, man, don't don't let your guard down because we know how things, how things can happen. And Goose had got my, he had my number. From the very first at bat in the major leagues, he blew me away on three pitches. And, uh, you know, I begged to, to face the goose, which nobody would in their right mind and when I was a rookie. But I wanted to see the best, and regardless of the outcome. And, uh, you know, I had to, he, he kept owning me as I faced him throughout my career. Mm. When I came up there and uh, they were talking about walking me intentionally, with Lance coming up, who had already hit a home run off him, you know, I was like, right. I just kept looking in the upper deck saying, it's the World Series, it's going to be different, Goose. And when uh, Dick Williams went out there, I just visualized it going up there and started going like this, Sparky, 10 bucks going up there, going up there, because 
I knew it was going on, but I didn't want to think about that. I didn't want to concede to that. Um, you can see right here, Dick Williams went out. He put up four fingers. Who said no? Got a 1-0 count. And, boy, it looks so easy right there. So many years <laughs> later, as we all know, it's not an easy thing. It, it was our year. What a special group. Just to sit here and watch the ending with Lopi and, and Willie, yeah. Bill Scherer. There's so many different people that did such a great job. I got to tell you, I, I watched the entire game yesterday. I watched it earlier today. I'm going to watch it again tonight, 8 o'clock, Fox Sports Detroit. There were some performances that I think don't get enough recognition. We'll get to that in a moment. But you guys have all talked about winning the division at home, winning the pennant at home, and winning the World Series at home. The Tigers were the first team since the 69 Mets to do that. Why was that important, Tram? Well, just because of the fan base. And uh, we had been 16 years, 68. You know, when you look at it now, um, you know, that's a long time ago. But uh, from 68 to 84, we thought it was a long time. And we talked, we've talked about this a few times that, uh, you know, the way the technology was, anytime there was a rain delay, you know, they, they stuck up the 60s. They stuck on the 68 World Series highlights, and we kind of was like, ah, we want to make a name for ourselves. Um, but again, just the way that the people, you think back to the wave that year, just for an example, and they actually closed the bleachers down for a, you know, a month or a few weeks. Uh, good behavior. They were, yeah, they were using some foul language, and the, and, the, and the fans were having a great time. And um, obviously, when you're winning, I mean, uh, there's going to be more support. There was that year, obviously, but... Uh, Again, just to be able to celebrate and do it at home. And, and we all had family. I mean, you know, Gibby's from there. So obviously he's got even more people there. But uh, just the fact that we didn't want to have to get on a plane and have to come on, you know, fly across the con country to come come back, that you got to do it all at home. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, it's always going to be a little more sweeter at home. But the fans deserve it, to be honest with you. I mean, really, to cut to the chase. Um, and uh, we wanted to celebrate and party and 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 we did add some pressure to you dan knowing that that's what you wanted to do no you know i just sit there and, and think about listening to tram describe that and i i just always think back to winning 104 games during the season and you know almost like thinking it was destiny for us to do that because we started off in kansas city and got a chance to clinch it at home we started off in san diego and got a chance to clinch it at home so um, you know, just having the best record in baseball and starting off on the road just seems a little bit odd. But, uh, you know, each celebration got bigger and bigger, you know, getting off to the great start, then, uh, you know, winning against Milwaukee, clinching the division, and then, you know, had that great game, one to nothing game against Kansas City, winning that game. And then at home, each one got got incrementally more exciting as, as it went by. And then, you uh, um, but, but that last one was very, very special, as I'm sure that we'll we'll get into. That was a long, long celebration in the clubhouse and and a crazy, crazy atmosphere outside the ballpark once we left. Yeah, it, it was, it was unbelievable. The, the feeling was incredible throughout the entire <laughs> state of Michigan. Shep, I'm not sure the Padre players appreciated the, <laughs> yeah. the yeah. welcome, the Tiger fans welcome, you know, and, and I don't blame them. Apparently, uh, they got a little, a little maybe out of control out there. Uh, nevertheless, we were, I didn't know, I don't think any of us knew what was going on outside. Uh, we were just having a good old time, and uh, as we should. Uh, but I do know that, uh, you know, the buses outside the, uh, the, the visiting clubhouse, uh, uh, they, they were a little, uh, uh, they were a little scared, to be honest with you. So, you know what, but uh, you know, our fans, my God, they, they deserved it. And, uh, you know, that year was, uh, as Gibby mentioned, it was an incredible year. You know, what's the thing that I remember, and what I watched and it really sunk in was Tiger Stadium was a bird of its own, okay? Mm -hmm. The way it was constructed, I remember the first time that I came out there and Sparky had put me in right field after I played center field all spring training. I dropped two fly balls that day. I lost them in the sun. But when I went out there to take the he said, yeah, just go out there and shag it through. You'll be fine, kid. <laughs> I went there, and that third deck was really, really tall. And the ball would go up and touch the high sky. And when Tony Gwynn bailed out of that one, I tell you what, you get, you lose it in there. It was a different looking thing. And the fans, just their energy, you know, they knew what was going on. Every 
part of the itinerary pre-game and in the game. They understood it was going to happen. They were really exciting and vibrant. And after the game, uh, you know, a couple guys ruined it for some of the people, but we all we all made it. And I just remember the feeling when we went to that parade. Everybody was getting along. There's really no problems, and that's a, that's a really cool thing. And then to be and celebrate with your teammates that way, to watch guys fight through things mm-hmm. for their team, not just for themselves, very, very rewarding. Fellas, what was that celebration like in the clubhouse? What was the feeling? What was the celebration like? Well, you know, you know, Chef. Let me let me just uh, tell you a quick story here. Where um, last year when we celebrated our 35th anniversary, um, you know, they kept playing the celebration. Everybody streaming out of the dugout, you know, and everybody, uh, you know, uh, in the group hug and everything like that. And they they kept a lot of people come up to me and they said, where were you? You know, I, I didn't see you. What happened and everything? Well, I had got taken out, you know, in the fourth inning. So I was watching most of the game up in the club, yeah. you know, and, and, and yeah. And, and by the time, by the time, it, you know, the last out was made, you couldn't get into the dugout. You know, I mean, there were so many people, you know, with all the September call-ups and everything and ushers and police and everything like that. Well, so I had to wait for everybody to come off the field, come down in the tunnel, you know, just wow. to start high-fiving everybody and never got a chance to run out of the field. You got to remember those dugouts, you know, Ty Cobb. Right. <laughs> I mean, we used to joke about that. Yeah. Everybody hit their head, especially the guys that are taller. I mean, you go up uh, with a when you saw a, a ball or some sort of play, I mean, guys yeah. jump up and, oh, and, and and everybody that's ever been in Tiger Stadium, at least for a few games, they hit their head on top of the dugout, and uh, it was it was a homely place. I mean, I know the visiting players did not like coming over there. They didn't like a mm-hmm. visiting clubhouse because mm-hmm. it wasn't very big. Uh, it was the only uh, double deck, completely enclosed stadium. So when they were when they were Stomping their feet, man. You heard it. It rocked. And uh, I thought it was a whole grass. Thing. How about that, Tram? The grass was so long on the infield <laughs> and the outfield, you could barely run. They, they did not like that at all. Yeah, then we had just had Easter, so it was a good it would have been a good place to hide your Easter eggs because Sparky <laughs> wanted that grass thick and it was a thick texture g- grass, anyways. But uh yeah, it, it was it was home for us for sure. That's what uh, Tram and Peach is saying. We're playing golf and they can't find their ball because they <laughs> Yeah, we've all been guilty of that with you, Gibby. We've all been guilty of that. So you guys, you guys are such a close team. What, what were some of the celebration parties like afterwards? Where'd you guys go? What did you do? How long did you treasure the moment? Go ahead, Gib. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> no, you know, I, it, initially we celebrated in the uh, in the clubhouse, and you come in, they have coolers with some champagne in there, and we all were doing that. No goggles. We took it. <laughs> That's uh, there happened to be, um, you know, people are in different, um, uh, I guess, robed differently. Uh, there was one gentleman in that was in there in a suit, and somebody came up with the idea. There was a cooler where there's no champagne left. There was just ice and ice water. So two of the players picked it up and dumped them over this gentleman's head. Uh, unfortunately, it was the owner, Tom Monahan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he kind of turned around really quick. It was Lance Parrish and I, actually. He turned around really quick because it was cold. I said, come on, man, let's go. We just won the World Series. He kind of looked at me. Uh, it took him a while, I think, to really appreciate it. Mm. And, uh, you know, we had our differences, Mr. Monahan and I, but in the end, uh, you know, he was a, a, a great owner for us. And he found out uh, after that year, you know, you win it your first year. That doesn't happen very often. Right. But, uh, you know, he had that success that's special in his heart as well. And, uh, you know, we played our ass off. We, mm-hmm. we, we really did. There's no disgrace about the way we played. We came out. We went after it. We stood up to everybody. We supported everybody. And, uh, you know, Sparky kind of had an all-business attitude. You know, we had our family had a little corner over there that maybe we could find. But, you know, he wanted us to come in. Our locker room was not big at all. No. They're not like they are today. Right. We are definitely uh, living in the dorm together. 
Fellas, I, I thought it was a great Facebook Live not too long ago where Steve Eisenman came on, talked about the 1997 Stanley Cup championship. Not till, till the next morning did he sit there and look at the Stanley Cup and read all the names. Did he truly appreciate and understand what he and his teammates had just accomplished? When did that moment sink in for you? Tram, why don't you hit that first? Well, I mean, I'm just uh, thinking about a, a number of things. And and we all, you know, again, as, as we all know that the Tiger – Tiger Clubhouse was not that big. I mean, you can let alone the visiting side, the home side was bigger, obviously, but not a whole lot bigger. And so we were all, you know, again, we're, we're close. We're going to be close in proximity. We really couldn't go anywhere. I don't remember exactly what time we left, to be honest with you. I know that uh, it was a late afternoon game, and I want to guess that, uh, you know, got home by, you know, sometime before midnight. Uh, and what's that? I said 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Well, for me, and, and, and again, everybody's got their own story here, is that uh, I was trying to make sure, I mean, heck, I had my good time, believe me. And I know that Daryl Evans was throwing a, a party on the east side, but I, I had been invited to do Good Morning America, and I had to be ready to go at 5.30. And it's not like it is now where you can just sit at home and they can hook you up. Yeah. I had to go to the studio. So I was trying to make sure that I wasn't, you know, I at least had, was somewhat coherent. And so I decided to go home. Now, again, I had some family from, from out here on the West Coast. And so we went there and enjoyed ourselves for, you know, a few more hours. I got a couple hours of sleep and then ended up doing that that interview with Good Morning America, which at the time well, it was a pretty big deal. So I didn't want to blow them off. I, I, I felt like that was something I needed to do. But, you know, I really, my heart wanted to go over to the east side with Daryl and go over there and, and, and party a little bit more. But I, I, I forget again what exactly time I did get home, but I know it was late. Yeah, and Daryl's, uh, they have mimosas there at 8 a.m. I remember that. <laughs> um, I had to get together at my house and uh, some strange people just walked in. You know, you, you, just, you just can't keep track of everybody. I was like, does anybody know this guy? I just walked through the house. You know, obviously, we were feeling good. We chased him out of there quickly. Dan, were you at the, were you on the east side with Daryl, or were you at Gibby's house? What did you? What was your celebration like? Well, you know, I, I will tell you um, the, because um, we were talking about outside of Tiger Stadium, and I remember it was about three hours that we were in Tiger Stadium, yeah. and once we left that little, you know cookie cutter or piece of pie parking lot there in Tiger Stadium. I remember, yeah, pulling out of there and the mounted police had formed a tunnel and I, I, I'd i never seen that and, and how impressive that was. So that was right away like, oh my gosh, you know, this something special just happened. My mom and dad, my sister were in from California. So we immediately went to Casey's, which is like 200 feet from Tiger Stadium and celebrated in there. And then I did end up down at Daryl's, but uh, um, kind of it, it was kind of late and it was not, you know, everybody had kind of dispersed. That might have been about three. But I'll tell you when it really, really hit me and, and, and not just because, you know, Gibby's great game and everything. But I remember getting up that next morning and picking up and, and I think it was the free press. Mary Schroeder took it. I, I think the iconic fig, the picture of Gibby, you know, that one, that one right there. That's the one. And when I saw that and I just went, you know what? That was it. That That's when it just hit me. Um, and, and, and just that, you know, that was the visual. Just the, yep, that's a champion's pose right there. Yeah. Yeah. Does it? How much does it resonate with you guys? How much you still mean to people for what you've done? I mean, for what you've done. I mean, it really well, was for many I of us. Wanna, it was I a life changing. Cut in on that because I, I just want Gibby to to give his thoughts. I mean, that picture is is more than cool. Yeah. I mean, that's is. something that's a lifetime. That's a, that's something that can never will never be duplicated. That particular photo. And to catch that the way it is, man, I mean, I know what yeah. he's feeling. Obviously, when right. you saw him high five in the players, yeah. uh, my God, I felt for Alex Grammis and Trixie <laughs> because they couldn't handle that. But, mm -hmm. player, but my God, he was he was, uh, he was was worked up, and it was awesome. But I'd just uh, like to hear his thoughts. Yeah, that picture, what do you guys think I is the coolest part of that picture to me? Uh, the well, let's see it you, again. Okay, well, I I was gonna I was gonna bring up the fact that the, your right knee is it looks like a knee pad like in football. It's almost gone right here. That's pretty cool. 
That's my favorite part of that picture. Ah, the sliding. Well, up on that pop up to the second baseman. And, you know, we came out, we were feeling it. And uh, we, were, we were ready. I mean, right out of the gate, we got on and we got on and right out of the gate, we scored what two in the first. And, you know, I know that I was feeling like pushing and pushing the pace. Even when I slid into second, I was going in there late. When I was on third base, you know, when the ball goes up like that, you're generally not thinking you're going to score. But that's why you watch the play. You know, Tram's always one of his favorite sayings is head on a swivel. So all these things that are going on around you. So you know what it's supposed to be going on, but if you see something a little out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. you, you, you might take advantage of something. So, um, you know, right here, Rusty Koontz comes up and hits his deep fly ball. <laughs> and, uh, only I, could just, I could just read it. And Wiggins, you know, he's just backpedaling. So you're reading that backpedaling. And, you know, I'm saying, hey, you know, I have strengths and I have weaknesses. One of my strengths is, I'm aggressive. I take good routes. I get good jumps. And if I need to, I've got that final piece if I need to uh, dislodge the ball from the glove. And that was an exciting play to me. And we didn't have to do that. We got the run. And, you know, they came back. Lance hit the home run. And then I, we got the home run at the end. But, you know, we were scared to death. I know that we were going to lose. We started 35-5. and five. We lost three in a row in Seattle. We didn't think we were ever going to lose right there. And we felt like Toronto was on our butt the whole year. But in the end, it was, you know, start to finish that um, we, we held it together. We didn't, you know, sometimes your heads, the success can be very dangerous. Yeah. This team, it was not. Sparky did a heck of a job. And uh, there's so many memories that we can and can't talk about about this 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 year, a special year. And, well, sometimes we get on the air. Danny, I'd like to hear what you have to say about this. You don't want to say, well, we played, you know, but it, you know what? That's why we played. So, you know, you, you got to watch how you say it. But some of the Tigers, the young Tigers coming up, I'd like them to watch that World Series. Absolutely. Game to game. Watch every single one of them. And, you know, this that doesn't mean you're going to be like us. But we found our identity, who we were who we could count on to do what, who's going to protect who, who could get somebody in, mm -hmm. who's going to, who could drop one down. And we knew what everybody was capable of doing it. And if you look at the Padres in that game, they had a terrible game. I mean, they did not play a sound game. They didn't give themselves a good chance. But you got to give us a little bit of crap because we pressured them. Sure. I mean, Gary, yeah, Gary Templeton not covering – not not being on the bag, for example, when when when, when Tram laid down the bunt, or Lou Whitaker actually laid oh, down yeah. the bunt. Uh, but let me bring up a few instances. I think some underrated performances. Aurelio Lopez threw twenty five pitches in that game, twenty one for strikes, and when he was taken out, he had thrown fourteen consecutive strikes. What did he mean to your ball club, and is that an overlooked performance in your guys' mind? You, you know what? I'll, I'll I'll chime in on that because. Uh, really. Actually, when uh, I, I had the numbers written down the last uh, Facebook chat we did, but I think he threw like 140 innings that year, you know, as a as like a, you know, closer, or, you know, setup man, 140 innings, you know, and there was plenty of times where, you know, I'd go six or seven and he'd come in and finish off a game. And but that that particular game five, I never saw him throw as hard as he did and he just was raring back and and tram you had a wonderful seat right there you know watching it but he threw hard all the time but that game right there he had a little extra pop and i i don't think i ever saw anybody jack or or uh willie anybody throw as hard as aurelio did in that game five for that uh two and what was it two and a third innings that he ended up throwing you know, he, he had a rubber arm. He had a rubber arm. And, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm laughing because there's so many things to it. I mean, we played with Lopi uh, for a few years. Mm -hmm. And I used to always laugh when he'd come in from the, from the uh, bullpen and he'd warm up and he threw all this garbage. He had the screwball. He had a curveball. He had this, he had that. 
And then when he'd get out on the mound, he'd shake, he'd shake, he'd shake, and Lance like, oh, I know what he's doing. He's going to throw a fastball. And the, and the other team, they didn't, they didn't have the scouting reports. They didn't have the kind of information that they have today. But he was going to throw a fastball most of the time. But what he could do, and it just goes to show you when you can locate, he can locate. You talked about the strikes, 21 out of 25. That's what he did time and time again. And Sparky could always go and use him. Obviously, Willie, you know, being the Cy Young and the MVP for the season that year. But Aurelio Lopez was huge for us. I mean, there might have been no bigger guy on our club than Aurelio Lopez. And and then uh, bring up another guy who I uh, give you always talk about Dave Bergman, what a great teammate he was. Dave Bergman comes in in the eighth as a defensive replacement. Kurt Pavacqua hits that solo homer. Salazar's on first, and Willie Hernandez picks him off. That's a tough spot, isn't it, for a first baseman to come in and then make a perfect throw down to second. Otherwise, that tying runs at second base. Well, that was a gutsy play by San Diego. To, was the, that was the tying run. To put him in peril like that. Um, as a first baseman, you got to come and get the ball, and you got to make an accurate throw on the inside. Tram knows he can tell you what it's like coming down there. You don't step up in front of that bag. It's very hard. The runner can get in the way. But that's just how our year went. Um, we executed that play. We had to pick. Willie did not have a great move, okay? Mm -hmm. But he made a good throw. Bergie was on his way, cut down the distance, made a strike throw. And then, you know, they, they were one run down. That was the tie run. But, um, you know, again, that, that worked for us the whole year. We believed in it. Whatever we were told to do, we did it. And a little more. The you know, Shep, Shep, oh, I, I was just going to, you know, get back to Gibby. What Gibby says about, I mean, when you're in the major leagues, I mean, he was asking about the current Tigers and then us and everything, how you compare them. But everybody's got a lot of talent or you wouldn't be in the major leagues. Gibby talks about intangibles all the time. What separates or what little thing do you have that will take somebody you know, over the top and, you know, talk about all the guys on that team. Every one of them had some sort of little intangible that made them just that little bit extra where they didn't have to rely on just their God-given natural ability. You guys had mentioned starting, you know, the 35 and five starts, 17 straight on the road, right? How mentally draining was that season for each of you guys before we let you go and watch game five on Fox Sports Detroit tonight? Well, I loved it. I, I don't know about mentally draining. I think from yeah. the staff's point of view, and we found out, you know, obviously later on, Sparky and the other coaching staff, um, how they felt about it. But when you're playing and, you know, not to be boastful or cocky, but you do have to feel good and confident in yourself that it didn't matter that year, whoever we played, we felt we were going to win. Um, but the coaching staff, if we wouldn't have, they felt like, you know, a lot of people would have forgot all the things that we had accomplished up to that point. And, and to a point, they're right. People would have forgotten about the great start in the 17 games in a row on the road. But we capped it off with a world championship. And so the story, it makes it even better. The coaching staff felt it. The players, I, I, I don't know. I just was kind of riding the wave. I, I don't know about you guys, but that's how I felt. Yeah, and I think Sparky always talked about that was one of the big things, talk about intangibles again, that – he always said, hey, we, we got a wonderful ball club and it's very, very talented. But what he did was try to deflect a little bit of that, you know, where you're always out there talking about it and, you know, meeting with the writers and and constantly, you know, having to bring up a, a good subject or a, a bad game or something like that. He was always the go to person, you know, and he, he always wanted to take that part of it away from us to where we could just go out and just concentrate really on playing the game. So it was in, you know, and I agree with Tram. I, it wasn't mentally, I think, I mean, physically more than anything. I mean, going through 162 games and I, I mean, it's, it's, you, you earn it when you win, uh, you win a championship like that. But as far as mentally draining, no, I was, uh, uh, we we're just enjoying the whole thing. Gibby, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be that way. I mean, I feel like I could go do it right now. Yeah. I remember one day that Sparky came in, I'd hit a home run to, walk off a game and he says big boy you know he call, he'd call me in his office all the time he'd say lewis needs a little loving today he goes uh, the media was kind of riding because we had lost some games in a row so he asked me so from time to time to do some things stupid so we could deflect it to me and everybody else could relax or he just wanted to make sure that i didn't 
because so many things happened in the game. Lou made a great play and Tram turned a double play before we went to extra innings and we won it on my home run. That's the master piece that Sparky was. He, he understood us. He got to know us and he, you know, he lets you celebrate, but not till it was time. And when Larry Herndon caught that last ball, mm. that's, that's what it's all about. And we hope to see another one of those world championships real soon. And we'll, our 84 uh, Tigers will take a back seat to that. We, we welcome it. Go get them, boys. Go no go doubt. Well Go-Rail. said. Go well right. said. I agree. That, that is well by. said, fellas. You know, um, you guys scored first in every game of the World Series. You scored in the first inning four of the five games. You brought incredible memories. And we see it right here on our Facebook Live. So many people saying, greatest summer of my life. It's because of what you guys did. It means an awful lot. It still means a great deal to me and my friends. Thanks for being part of it, guys. Everybody, enjoy the Tigers and the Padres Game 5, Tiger Stadium, 1984 World Series on Fox Sports Detroit right now. See you, boys. Thanks a lot, you See guys. You guys.